Mini episode 599 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by the Unheard Scene, your home for great music interviews of all stripes. Follow them on the web at unheardscene.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to mini-episode 599 of the FDH Lounge. Rick Morris and Ken Detweiler, your FDH Lounge dignitaries. We broke down the American League circa Labor Day weekend 2015 in 598. We're going to do the same for the National League here in 599. And in looking at the National League, Ken, I figure uh, maybe the most effective way to do this is to kind of get the bottom feeders out of the way. Because I'll tell you, from doing the buy monthly uh, power rankings for the FDH Lounge uh, Multimedia Magazine. The, the bottom six teams in baseball, I think, as of our beginning of September ones, are all in the National League. That's what accounts for the, the big imbalance here in the National League. They both have the best division, which is the Central, and then they have the worst uh, division, which is the East, because you have uh, the, the, just the gravitational effect of Miami, Atlanta, and Philadelphia pulling everybody down. At, at that point, uh, let's start with Philadelphia because they were the one that was expected to be there. Maybe Atlanta to a degree in their rebuilding process, but uh, people were kind of making some noise after the trading deadline when they uh, dumped uh, Hamels and you know made some moves here in Papelbon, and they got hot for a little bit there. And everyone's like, "OMG, Philadelphia gonna make a big run!" And you see now that was a mirage. I never believed it was anything, but but the future. And you look at uh, how things are going there. The future does look fairly promising here. Franco is sort of one of these post-hype guys who broke through eventually. And, yeah. you know, they do have some, some building blocks uh, eventually. But they really, they, they made the big mistake of putting off the rebuilding process. And you look at Houston. That's why it was as long and painful as it was because they put off the inevitable. They didn't want to admit after the bagwell Biggio era that it was over. Philadelphia is going to regret only going whole hog on rebuilding, I think, at this point in time. Yeah, their Keystone kids are out in uh, L.A. right now. Yep. Um, They're stuck with Howard because that awful deal. Well, and I, that's what I was, That's exactly where I was going to go with this, Rick. All winter long, they mm-hmm. said, Howard, they're going to get rid of Howard. They're gonna, they came out and just said it right to his face repeatedly. Yep. We're going to get rid of you. The only one that's still left out of Papelbon and Utley and the rest of the gas house gang mm-hmm. uh, is Howard. They, nobody <laughs> will well, take that contract. You know, if, if they thought that he was going to somehow, you know, decide to retire because his feelings were bruised, you know what I think back to around the time of the uh, the turn of the millennium here and uh, what uh, fellow lounge dignitary Kyle Ross likes to call the greatest sport of them all, a.k.a. wrestling, I go back to the old job <laughs> squad with Al <laughs> Snow and those guys. They had the saying, pin me, pay me. And that was, that's basically where Ryan Howard is right now. Yes. Pin me, pay me. You're yeah. going to have to pay me my 25 mil, bitch. That's and then, where he's at. Yeah. And you can't blame the guy. I mean, you know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I just I feel bad for Ron Glassnap and Joe Ortiz. Yes. Two, Some guys two, we know that are Philly fans. Two uh, friends of ours. I join you in that. And, uh, again, though. And, and Howard with 20-plus home runs, that's, if not, you know, an A-Rod-esque surprise, at least a mild surprise at this stage of the game. Yeah, he's a Dave Kingman. So, yeah, I mean, he can at least, you know, give you a little bit of pop while he's taking up a spot on your roster there and, you know, holding back. Now, then again, I don't know that anybody is busting through the gates at first base in their minor league system here. It's going to no. be a difficult rebuilding process for them but right. at least now it's finally underway albeit probably two years after when it should have started atlanta meanwhile in the division is right about where they thought they would be they're targeting 2017 the start of the new ballpark yeah. john hart has been there and done that in terms of trying to get a team attuned so that they're ready to go day one in a new park he's you know he, he sort of started his career being in charge doing that and he's going to end his career being in charge of a team 25 years later under the same Doing circumstances. The same. Yeah, it works. Yeah, it does. It does, and he's very good at it. Yep. And uh, it's weird, though, because 
they had a farm system. I mean, their, their farm system's been barren for the last year or two. But you look at when the guys have been coming through previous to that, you know, whether it be uh, Tehran, whether it be Freeman, whether it be... Mike uh, Miner? Yes. When you had a lot of those guys bursting through, and it's funny because we did a segment on the lounge. Uh, we recorded it and put it up February 29th, 2012. And this was an idea that lounge dignitary Nate Noy and I had had, and we recorded this with uh, fellow dignitary uh, Chris Galloway. Mm-hmm. And it was called... Uh, the uh, uh, the leap year uh, time, uh, and, I, and I'm mangling it right now, but it, w- it was a time capsule. I believe it was the leap year time. Like, we made predictions for the next four years, so we're supposed to reconvene February 29th of next year and see what we did. Teams to repeat ch- as champions or win more than two championships in sports between 2012 and 2016, I remember saying the Atlanta Braves because I thought they were going to be peaking right about oh, now, sure. 2014, 2015, whatever. Wow. I thought they could win two titles. Yeah. So, to me, they're a disappointment because they didn't even sniff one. Really. Right, right. You know, so that they're a disappointment. I mean, for, for Hart to be having to come in and dismantle what they had, and, you know, I understand that rebuilds can't take – shorter in baseball these days and that's what he's counting on because 2015 as we tape this or 2017 isn't too far away no well you're right they had pitching like you just mentioned and Mm -hmm. freddie freeman and a couple other good ball players like minor really didn't pan out and so it was a combination of guys not panning out and you know other things that happened but yeah it makes you uh makes you wonder what was going on there but yep Certainly Atlanta is uh, a, a team that, uh, again, they, they were playing above their head for a, for a decent chunk of the season. But, you know, water finds its own level, basically. Yeah, it does. So, and, and, and he certainly wasn't going to trade to put them in a better position for right now because they've kind of written off this uh, period of time. A team that's in the exact opposite circumstance didn't expect to be here, but it's sort of Groundhog Day in Miami because this is what happened when they first opened up their park. Well... And they bring the general manager in to run the club? Yeah, that was kind of weird. A guy without any field managing experience at any kind of serious level. And now I heard that uh, the rumor was today, not rumor, it was stated, that uh, the Marlins were having a big meeting today or tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I guess it was today because some of the scouts are already gone. They're starting to really start to clear house. Yep. And... Uh, who knows what's going on? And that, well, that I'm sure it wasn't the that. scouts that were saying go overpay these guys, and no. you know it's it's always the working man that ends up being the no. fall guy, isn't it? Really? Well, they said this guy, and I can't his name escapes me, but uh, who was the general manager mm-hmm. who stepped who came down? Uh, Jennings. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, they said that he's probably not going to be back okay. as a general manager. Even uh, they're going to start. They're just going to clean it up. Well, Jeffrey Luria can't fire himself, so yeah, you know, or won't. So right, that's what you have. But that team has talent. They they do, they do, and that's you know, it, you've got Fernandez and Hernandez. Yeah, um, yeah, Stanton when when he's healthy, when he's not uh, you know banged up, uh, he's a guy you can build around. They definitely have some very nice some uh, pieces. pieces in there. They yes. they, they do, they do, uh, and. Uh, yeah, you know, your boy Christian Yelich is uh, somebody that uh, <laughs> can produce for them. D. Gordon has just been a very, very nice surprise. He has, as far as being a late bloomer, sort of at the top of the line up there. And you know, yeah, they're they're a team that's going to be heard from probably as early as next year. You get a you get a full season in there with Jose uh, Fernandez, and you know, it's really going to make a difference. I think getting him from day one and uh, some of the other moves that can be made uh, there. But yeah, it's. You know, it, it never should have gone off the tracks this badly. No, no. Again, it's health. A lot of it is. Right. Uh, and I, I still question any team in Florida even having a team with the fan support. Yeah, um, yeah. It, uh, they are a bunch of front runners in Miami. And, uh, you know, we may be, uh, you know, we may be a little bit bitter because of things like LeBron in the 97 World Series. But that doesn't mean it ain't true. No, no. You know, so, <laughs> you know, doesn't mean we're not right about that. Or the and, World Series they stole from us. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah that, uh, uh, you know, w- which I, out of all the Cleveland sports memories, I always say that's the worst one. You you can keep your, your drive, your fumble, whatever, because, look, the drive 
would I mean that tied the game and sent it into overtime on, on by the way why is it that the rest of the country doesn't realize that Rich Carlos's field goal never went through the uprights that field goal was no good no, but I never I, hear anybody outside of Cleveland mention that no it's weird isn't it yes, yeah it is. They, yeah well. it is but you know in the fumble okay Biner would have just tied the game granted we had a big comeback we had all the momentum it would have been the mirror image of what they did to us the previous year with the drive yeah. but in either instance is that anything that decided the outcome the 97 World Series, and, and Grover, I love you, but ugh, I don't know anybody in this city that wasn't screaming for him to just to leave Brian Anderson in for the ninth inning. Well, and do you remember the aforementioned Bobby DiBiase on yes. our show? Mm -hmm. Said they already had the Visqueen up, and yeah. they were putting Chad OJ's name on the most valuable yeah. player of the series. Yeah. And then pack it up, boys. We're taking it to the well, other, other in, locker room. In terms of sentiment, too, and if I remember correctly, I that's think that's the last story. game. It is. It totally is. That's the last game Herb Score ever called for us, really? I believe. I think that was his retirement wow. year. You can only I mean, hear it here at the FDH. Line. Yeah, and that's <laughs> and it's like that just makes it worse because I understand that nationally, he, you know, he doesn't have the profile uh, that uh, the, the great Harry Callis did or the great no. Vin Scully or anybody else, but, like, every town's got a guy, you know, Bob Prince in Pittsburgh yep. and the great Ernie Harwell in Detroit, who you and I had the luxury of uh, oh. interviewing the one time here. Herb Score was our guy. Yeah. 97 Indians, that hurts me worse than any of yeah. the rest of the Cleveland sports memories. It yeah. just does. We were yeah. right there. Yeah, we were right there. We had it, and it was gone. And it was, you know, and so, you know, it, yeah, it, uh, it for, for, for whatever tiny uh, uh, amount that it helps, it does help a little bit to see the Marlins have a year like they've had this year. I'm taking a moment of silence in order <laughs> yeah. for us Indian fans. Yeah. <laughs> Cleveland fans. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, if the Marlins are ever going to have a moment of silence for anything, you'll get some flatulence from me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, in terms of a team that had it right there and let it get away, oh, you know, as we continue to look at the bottom feeders of the National League, that's a logical segue to the Reds, is it not? Because – it is. Yeah, the how, do, how have they, they sucked so bad? I mean, a, a Walt Jockety team, this is light years away from what was accomplished in St. Louis. It really, really is. It and looks, uh, looks like a Paul Brown team now. Yeah. <laughs> they have, they have you know, in the, the latter years, Paul Brown, not the glory years yeah, that we true. got. <laughs> yeah, that's what we have now. No. Yeah. Although they still can't do anything in the playoffs. Like no, that. no, they can't. Uh, they, they have the uh, – the uh, the Dalton ceiling on them, as it were, but uh, yes. you know, the the, the Reds uh, should be uh, so fortunate as to even to have that, and it's it's a thing too where I, I was looking at it this year, and you know the notion, and again they they weren't quite the bottom feeders that they they are now. They weren't at that point back at the trading deadline, although they were basically out of it. But this notion of well, we've got to trade uh, Johnny Cueto because he's gonna be a free agent at the end of the year. I'm like, really? I would have thought a Walt Jockety team, a well-run team, wouldn't be just resigned to losing him. How, well, how do you be like, okay, time to trade our ace pitcher in his prime? Well, look at it this way, too. The, as I'm listening to you here, Rick, mm -hmm. it's what team in the major leagues wouldn't want three hitters like Frazier, Bruce, and Votto yeah. this year? Yeah. Having a closer like Chapman. Yes. Having an ace. A team that has an ace. Yeah. What's their excuse? Cueto. I mean, just those five players alone right. should give you contention time. They, they got so, you know, their, their lineup isn't, you know, sterling top to bottom. But, you know, when you've got a guy like Zach Cozart who doesn't suck anymore, that helps you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, Brandon Phillips, my good buddy. Uh, that's a yeah. <laughs> of course for any old school life's a pitch guys we are of course making light of the time he was very rude to me in the Buffalo Bison's clubhouse in 2004 when I was just trying to conduct an interview with him yep. but uh, <laughs> not that I have a long memory or anything and thank God I was stuck in traffic <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, you saw the stricken look on my face later oh my but uh, you know Phillips has kind of bounced back to where he's doing okay he doesn't have as much pop anymore but again you look at this lineup, there's, there's not any obvious reasons for this. If you were to put Cueto back in the rotation, and he's only been gone since July anyways, so that doesn't account for them having the horrible record that they do. Uh, again, you know, it, it just it's kind of inexplicable, and that's the kind of situation it should call for a house cleaning, and uh, that's kind of what they've been looking at with Milwaukee also yeah. too because – 
yeah, Milwaukee, now again, I, I think they, they would have had to been a little bit delusional to feel like they were really a player this yeah. year, especially in that division. But yep. I don't know that they, anybody expected it to go as poorly as it did. No. Because I, I don't think regression to the mean carries over one year to the next. Wasn't it? It was either last year or the year before. And I'm at the age, unfortunately, where years are blending together. But I'm pretty sure it was last year, wasn't it, where they got off to that, like, insane start? And like, How are so. the Brewers doing it? So. Yeah. Maybe this is just delayed progression to, or regression to the mean, as bad as they suck this year. I look at Milwaukee this year, and it's like vanilla ice cream. Yep. It's like, okay. But tastes good, but that's it. Yeah. I mean, and that, you know, you, you look at the lineup, and it seems pretty obvious because outside of Lind and Braun, who else really scares you in that lineup? Yeah, I mean, Luke Roy was hurt. And, uh, yeah, yeah, he has not been himself this year. He wasn't the, like he was the year before. You know. And, uh, you know, the other Chris Davis uh, is basically a sort of poor man's version, actually. You know, I mean, a hole in the swing, but a little less power. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I misspelled his name. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, but, yeah, it's and then the top three teams, which we'll discuss later. But, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's uh, a heck of a division to, to be in. Mil- I would not want to be Milwaukee and Cincinnati. You know, because they, they, they've got a hell of a hill to climb. I'll tell you what, those, those might be the two teams I pity most in baseball, medium to long term. How are you going to climb that hill in that division? Yeah. I, I just. I don't see it. I, I don't see it either. That's going to be brutal. That's like, the, that's like the American League East used to be. Yeah, yeah. You know, there are a few divisions like that at this point. That's one of them. You look at teams that are out of the mix here. We'll go to the, uh, the National League West. Start with a team that's not as far out of it, and, and, and they've been doing okay. But, again, no great shakes. Arizona, I mean, and they're, yeah. you know, it's, it's easy to see here going forward, you know, what the progression is. You build on guys like Pollock, Goldschmidt, who's, you know, one of the five best hitters of this generation. It, it's a pretty easy path. You know, you see that. You want to build around some of the, uh, uh, some, some of the talents that they have there. But uh, the pitching has a ways to go. That's kind of holding them back still. Yeah, Goldschmidt is my MVP of the National League. Yep. Uh, today. And that's the thing. You know, they, they may not be – a bad enough team, you know, it, it wouldn't be like an Andre Dawson on the Cubs in 87 situation, you know? I mean, right. Arizona's not right. a contender, but it's not like, you know, if he was on the Reds, nobody would say MVP. But I think Arizona being at least mediocre yeah. keeps him in the conversation. I agree with you. Yeah, because I think, well, you said the Reds. I think Votto would have to be in the top five. Sure. Over there. But he's, the I mean, he's got no chance he's because, it, it, you know, the whole thing about – and. and and I am somebody, by the way, who doesn't have a problem with Andre Dawson winning it, whatever. I don't like to get too literal on the valuable thing. Here, no. right? Everybody's just like, well, they no. could have finished in the last place without you. You know? Yeah. Like, come on, man. Okay? You, know, you can't tell me that, you know, as bad as a team is, then you might be a historically bad last place team without somebody. You know what I mean? I do. So, mm-hmm. you know, and w- without Goldschmidt... I mean, you know, we're at the point now with, you know, win shares and all that kind of stuff where we try to quantify how many wins uh, come from a player. But, you know, there's at least more than a handful of games, I think, that they would have lost had it not been for him. He is just – he is amazing. I mean – and it's a thing, too, and this is sort of like another conversation of where it's it's a shame – because and I've had this conversation uh, on, on, on Facebook with uh, old uh, STN cohort uh, Tony Mazur about how sure. we have such great baseball players today, but they're not known to the mainstream. And it's a shame that Goldschmidt's not really yes. known because it's like hey, and I use my dad as the perfect example. My dad's not really a baseball fan. But my okay. dad knew who Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Derek Jeter, sure. Cal Ripken, all these guys. Who outside of the baseball bubble these days even – who who knows how great, like historically great Mike Trout is? That like Mike Trout is maybe the best hitter we've seen in 50 years. Oh, yeah. Who outside of the baseball bubble knows that? Who knows that Paul Goldschmidt is like the modern-day Paul Bunyan, you know, this yeah. big ass-kicking mofo that can just hit the ball 600 feet? It's a shame. It really is. It really is, yeah. 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 And he's in, he's in a market that that's the other thing, and of course that's yeah the Phoenix the market yeah that's always good luck with case. that you yeah. know <laughs> you know you know you know you're you're playing before seventy five year olds with no disposable income you know what I mean, I mean that's, you know you know. You know, I don't think you're going to get rich playing in a market where old ladies are, you know, choosing between Diamondback season tickets and eating cat food. You know, I mean, that's 
Oh, jeez. I don't know. Am I, am I painting with a broad brush here? Yeah, a little <laughs> you know? bit. It's more like a roller. <laughs> Well, I, I've, I've never been the most politically correct of all the dignitaries. No, one of us. That's, that's what makes the show so blessed good. Oh, exactly. So. My, my constant presence keeps it from all, all being the, too All pleasant. the blue hairs out, yeah. of the, out there. There you go. Well, they're not my demographic anyway. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going there fast. So. Yeah. <laughs> What's a podcast? <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't, I don't think there's too many of them that are going to be picketing me based no. on what I just said. They'll be going to Dave game so they can get home yeah. go to bed well <laughs> just a stone's throw from there and probably the same demographic the san diego padres yes. they are at least a team that had uh expectations and again oh. me being the dummy who goes by the november you know who on november you know i, I thought miami san diego was going to be the wild card game this year uh they should have a uh, game uh after the season just to decide who the biggest disappointment was but uh yeah san diego as opposed to miami has at least been mediocre. But mediocre yeah. is not what we expected based on that offseason. They went for it now. And I've read uh, some very, very interesting commentary online about how the, uh, the general manager, Preller, should maybe have his nuts in the vice because, and I didn't quite realize this, but, I mean, how much he decimated the future for right now. I mean, I was like, okay, they really? traded away a bunch of prospects, but whatever. I, I, I didn't think it was quite everybody. No, it was everybody and their grandmothers that he leveraged for this year. Oh, I had so, no idea. Yeah. No, yeah. I did. I, I do give credit to the media where they do hype up this November. Yes. I mean, I could never remember talking in September what mm-hmm. happened in November, but right. it's been marketed so right. much that – here we are. We remember what they had, who, what team did what, and blah blah blah. And you're absolutely right. All they did on the MLB Network, which I watched during mm-hmm. the day, because I work out of the house, not because I'm in my 70s yet. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that, Rick. You're not in the Arizona demographic. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> but the media hyped that up so much. Yep. And uh, so it stays imprinted in your mind. To an extent, though, to an extent they did it because, especially in the case of San Diego, I mean, we could look at, you know, maybe Toronto two years ago and whatever, and it was pretty dramatic. What is more dramatic than what San Diego did in the last offseason? I mean, the, yeah. the, the number of things, and it's like it, what just put it over the top was acquiring Craig Kimbrell, the finest uh, closer, I think, of his generation. I mean, I, when I think of the baton passing, and I, I, he's not going to have the baton as long as Mariano Rivera, but I think the baton went from Rivera to him as far as being the best closer. Yes. So, you know, they, they got Kimbrell at the start of the season, but in off season, you know, you're looking at Upton and Kemp, and, you know, the Dodgers actually picked up a good chunk of Kemp's uh, money. And uh, just, you know, on down the line here, you know, Shields and, uh, oh, yeah. Everybody else uh, here, Will Myers. I mean, they're they're racking up former rookies of the year here, and uh, just a big, big disappointment. Just didn't happen. Yeah, you know, and I, as we talk, and as we've talked all night about these various teams, the injuries, and this is a topic for another day, mm-hmm. but the injuries have just stockpiled more and more each and every year. I mean, right? It used to be pitching. That everybody got hurt. Now right. people are pulling hamstrings left and right. And they're doing this and they're doing that. Sore backs. Uh, it's like, really? Yep. I mean, I hope somebody does a study about all the injuries. In the yeah. I mean, the Tommy John surgeries that keep mounting and mounting. And, um, there have been a lot of them, yeah. You know, and. Uh, San Diego's had injuries, but they can't even remotely, you know, claim that's, you know, the sole reason or even the predominant reason they've done what they've done. In terms of teams that have fallen on their ass where we pretty much expected it, the team we talked about it thus far was Philadelphia. The other obvious candidate would be Colorado. And that's, again, of all the places to build a team, that's the toughest in baseball because to try to build it to that ballpark and – you know, again, I, I do applaud what baseball has done in the last 10 years or so with the humidor because I think they've tried to normalize the circumstances as much as they could yep. as opposed to having it be a big outlier. But it's still a tough place uh, to, to build, and, and particularly, uh, again, a pitching staff. And what do you do? How do you, how do you build 
you know, that kind of a staff. And uh, I, I think it also makes it hard a little bit to an extent on the hitting end because the splits that you get are so just out of whack. They're vast. They are. They are. And it's like, how do you, how do you figure between them, you know, like what somebody would be like, you know, most of the time here, you know, and you want guys who are going to perform well in that park, but, you know. Now, I think a guy with the, with the power of, of a Nolan Arenado who has really kind of come on this year, he's for real. I he mean, that's is. a guy that in any park, I think. There's one of those young bucks that are coming up through yep. that we've talked about, which it is, I've never seen this before. And you mentioned it, too. It's wild. It yeah. is. I mean, yeah. these guys are just coming up and coming in and dominating. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's a great time to be a fan. And that's, that's the thing, too, is that, you know, relative to the names we were talking about before, you know, that, that everybody knew about, you know, down to like a Chipper Jones, you know, and certainly like, you know, Smoltz, Maddox, whatever. These guys are all just still anonymous. Yeah. And, and, and they are, yes. in many cases, putting up numbers that are better. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, did, did Chipper Jones, with all due respect to him, I'd like to compare his best year to what Arenado's doing this year. Yeah. And it might be a wash in, for Chipper, quite frankly, yeah. with the kind of year Arenado's having. And, yes, it's at Coors. But still, this kid's for real. Yep. And, uh, yeah, even if Colorado isn't and won't be anytime soon. But in terms of looking at the teams that count, going division by division here, okay. honestly, I think we all thought the Mets would be more likely to be in the first conversation than the second one that we're starting with them here. Because, yep. again, you know, they are – it's funny. We talk about our Cleveland Indians, and, and I've talked about this with my friend uh, and, and, and fellow FDH Lounge dignitary and 21st Century Media Alliance stalwart Russ Cohen, who's a Mets fan. You know, the Mets are basically what we were hoping for from our tribe. Yeah. Excellent pitching, and you hope that the hitting does just enough. Yep. And with the Mets, I mean, you know, they've been pretty much carried by the pitching. It's true. And you, you, you make a couple moves during the, uh, the course of the season here. You, you call up the great prospect, uh, Conforto. He's done a, a decent job for them thus far. And, you know, they've had some things that, are, that have gone their way. And, you know, certainly in terms of uh, – you know, uh, you, you, it, it's a little bit spotty, but you're going to get some pop from Granderson from time to time. And, uh, again, it, the, the one thing that has really helped to a tremendous degree was the trade of uh, Cespedes. And uh, you, did you hear about that great uh, tweet at the trading deadline from Jerry Seinfeld? No. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld celebrated it by going, it's a Cespedes for the rest of us. <laughs> like, that is genius. As opposed to the best of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Uh, yeah. You know, and he's not enough to prop up this offense completely. It's a yeah. But you look at the, the pitching here. Uh, you know, Jacob deGrom, who has spent a good part of the season trying to oh, edge yeah. his way into the conversation with Kershaw and Granke for best pitcher in baseball. And just the other guys as well here, this young Stephen Matz that I know you and I have had our eyes on for a long time yep. now. Matt Harvey in his comeback season. Uh, another one of these great young guys, Cindergaard. So even with Wheeler going down, the depth that they have had yeah. has just been awesome. It I has mean, been. It's, it's you know, phenomenal. It, you, you draw a great parallel. It's the team. It's our Indians. Yeah. Without the timely hitting and the defense. Apparently. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, without Carlos Santana being a chode that just that disappoints you <laughs> at every chode. opportunity. You know, the, the, the Indians, and again, I'll, I'll be interested to see this after this season, number of hitters left in scoring position. Has oh, a team yeah. stranded hitters as badly as the Indians have? Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like me back in the day playing uh, La Russa Baseball 92. You know, that's what it reminds yeah. me of, the way that they're struggling. They're leaving small villages on the bases. <laughs> they are pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ducks on the pond, as some oh, might yeah. say. Adversity, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the Mets... I think we would agree, and I think even a Mets fan like Russ Cohen would agree, there's just no way they should be leaving Washington in the dust right now because the Nationals no. on paper are still the most talented team in baseball, a team that's scuffling around 500 at the moment. I know you and I have said off air we're both Matt Williams guys. I am because one of my favorite out of all the Indians teams was the aforementioned 97 Indians. I got a couple friends where we've kind of talked about this and yes. how much we like kind of the National League flavor of that team with him and Marquise Grissom. And that was a fun team. That's the team that won 87 games and was kind of lucky to make that run. It was probably the least talented on paper of the teams during that run. But yeah. it was a fun team. Matt Williams was a big part of that. 
and a great guy and somebody who I know we have thought was going to be an excellent manager. But, I mean, somebody's got to take the fall for this one here. It doesn't look like they're coming back. They have a better chance of catching the Mets right now than they do uh, getting a wild card spot here from the Cubs. He always, he always remind, Matt Williams always reminded me of a um, Kurt Gibson type. Yeah. Just tough as nails. Yep. Just, I mean, to me, he was probably the best third baseman the Indians ever had. Right. In my lifetime. Right. I saw. Because his throws over the first were chest high. They had a little mustard on him. Yep. And you never heard him complain. He just went about his work. It was just. Yep. We talked about uh, Giovanni Urshela before. You need some pop at third base. Matt Williams had that to spare, yeah, buddy. And I love no, no disrespect to Travis Fryman when yep. he came over, but he just was not, to me, it was not Williams. Totes agree. Yeah. Uh, w Williams was my favorite third baseman of that yep. era. No yep. question about it. You know, from, from the point that Jim Tomey moved over to first, you know, Williams was my favorite. And I tell you what, too, it's one of these things, and, and again, you know, in talking about this on the show recently with Chip Carey, he pointed out, in all fairness, Washington has had a number of injuries this year, has never really gotten to put out the optimal lineup. But in terms of the pitching, that hasn't been as much of an issue. Fister, uh, Fister has been kind of a duh. He kind of has. You know, Scherzer has fallen off after the great start that he's had. Strasburg, I'm going to go out on a limb and say probably hasn't been completely healthy the whole year the way he's been pitching. I would agree because he was – they brought him back and then he put him on the DL again. And yeah. Brought you know, him back. And Jordan Zimmerman has, has had some issues. You know, he you know he hasn't been consistently at the level that we expect. But this is – you talk about the difference between this and other sports. Bryce Harper took the same jump forward this year – that Steph Curry did. Look at what Steph Curry did for Golden State. Yep. Look at what Bryce Harper has meant to the Washington Nationals. In baseball, you may be an MVP, but you're one spot in the lineup, buddy. You're one hitter out of yep. nine, and that includes the pitcher in the National League hitting. You know, and again, he hasn't had the protection up and down the lineup that right. you would have expected consistently. But that's the thing, though. I mean, Washington, when they're suffering injury problems, it's like, okay, we're not – the best lineup in the league anymore. We're back a little more towards the middle of the pack, but we still have awesome pitching. But then, you know, the pitching, that's been less explicable. And the bullpen, the, the bullpen has underachieved. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, and you got Ryan Zimmerman, who has been pretty much a no-show all year. Yeah. Um, in the hitting department. Worth hasn't played. Yeah. Um, of course, he hasn't lived up to his contract since they got him. Yeah, I mean, briefly he did, and then it's kind of been a fall off from there. Anthony Rendon hasn't really been healthy much of the year. And uh, it's just been one thing after another. Although I will, I will say this, though, on, on, uh, on hardball talk, that uh, I, I hesitate to even mention that troll Craig Calcantara on there uh, <laughs> mentioning, uh, because that, that's all that guy does is live to troll. But uh, him going after Matt Williams for... Uh, the meltdown that they had against St. Louis where Moss won the game. His thing was, and, and he, of course, being the consummate troll that he is, treated it as there's only one side to this argument of why didn't Matt Williams put in his closer in the ninth inning in a tie game? And you could make a case for that. Sure. Or you could make a case for saving your closer for hello when he has a lead. And he can close it. Yes. And they, the uh, <laughs> as Matt Williams pointed out after the game, you were going to have to pinch hit for whoever came in in the ninth inning anyway. So you weren't right. going to get two innings out of them. Because so it's National League. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it just, you know, we can rip Matt Williams, but to go after him on that and be like, you know, this is, this is the manifestation of all that he has done wrong this year. Okay. Uh, sure. Reaching as usual, troll. But uh, well, I watched, when I watched the Nationals, besides watching Williams, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, I don't know how old Harper is. Is he 21? I think so. Yeah, still He's super got the young. Quickest bat that I've seen. Amazing. I mean, yeah, that bat speed is phenomenal. It is. And I'm thinking, is, is he 21? And that's mm -hmm. it. And it's like, good lord, he's right there with Trout. Well, and that's the whole thing too. Is phenomenal. that in, in in 2012, it was a thing where everyone was it was you know it, it was it was one of these things where the media and then MLB was guilty of this as well. The whole thing of like. It's the magic and bird of baseball, Trout and Harper. Oh, yeah. like, would you get out of here with that crap? First of all, I hate media-invented storylines anyways. So you know, That's where I get into arguments with Kyle Ross on the show all the time because he <laughs> loves the ESPN you know, media no. complex and you know, the way that they invent oh. stories. But 
it's a thing too of like, let's be honest. Until this year, there was a tremendous, a, a decent, let's say decent sized gap between Trout and Harper. And this year, it's easier to speak of them in the same breath. I still, with Trout, I mean, I go back to, this is a guy in 2012. You know, you're used to the whole thing of like, this guy could be the next Ken Griffey. This guy could be the next Frank Thomas. That was a guy, like, as soon as he came up, people were saying Mickey Mantle. It's like, whoa, we're talking Mickey Mantle. We're not comparing him to, like, Reggie Jackson or anything. Like, oh, Mickey Mantle. So, I mean, to me, Trout is still the gold standard. I don't know that we've seen anybody like him in 50 years, but Harper is inching closer to him. Yeah. That's how great and he is. younger. Yes. A little bit. I mean, A little I bit, know, yeah. A couple years. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but, yeah, it's, it's the limitations on what one player can do. Right. It doesn't look like they're going to run down the Mets. In the Central, it has just been no. an amazing race at the top. I will tell you this, and this I, I never saw this coming, but – much like how I screwed up my pick in, the, in the, the American League of the Indians to come out of the American League in the National League, full credit, buddy. I said to the St. Louis Cardinals, I don't even know exactly why. Now, although I will say it's when they had Adam Wainwright, so in fairness okay. to me, I thought they were going to have another gun in there. But my sense is that they're just perennially in the mix every year. It had been a couple of years since they had been in the World Series or had won or whatever, and it's kind of like you can't pick against St. Louis too many years in a row. No. They're going to be there, and lo and behold, they've been a lot better than even I thought they were going to be, and uh, they just came out shot like a cannon and have been amazing. They've, they've been doing it largely on uh, the strength of their extraordinary depth at pitching, but uh, they've had a lineup. Uh, that's been pretty solid when it's needed to be, and yep. you know they they just look tremendous. They, they look like the team that I picked to win it all at the start of the season. Yeah, and I have to say, as the years have gone on, you know, growing up in the era that I grew up in, you didn't know much about the National League teams because mm-hmm. you never saw them. Right. But every year they have such a system that they just roll it over. They do. It's almost like the New England Patriots. It's mm-hmm. like there's a system top to bottom that just they buy in. Well, some of that may be, of course, on data that came from the uh, Houston Astros organization, and we'll find out how oh, that yeah, that's thing true. goes. <laughs> yeah, that's know, true. <laughs> may have a little bit to do with that in some ways, but, uh, you know, we'll see where the investigation leads. But uh, yeah. for the time being on the whole uh, innocent until proven guilty thing, yeah, they've really – been remarkable at uh, how they've, oh. uh, you know, ha- had such a dominant team this year. And and they do it different ways every day. They do. They do. You know, and I have to tell you, too, you know, that being in the same division, you know, my, my BFF, uh, Jeff Maslanich, uh, a, a great behind-the-scenes contributor to this show, he's a Pirates fan, and he's just despondent of, you know, year in and year out, it's the wild card. You know, it's yeah. one game because yeah. when you're in the same division with St. Louis, that's the barrel you're looking down. I mean – to an extent, you'd rather be in the middle bracket than we talked about before, Milwaukee and Cincinnati. Yeah. Really sucks to be them. That's probably the worst <laughs> spot to be in in baseball. Yeah. But Pittsburgh and the Cubs, now granted, you know, this is an anomaly. St. Louis is going to come back to the pack next year, and it'll probably be more of a legitimate three-way race between them. Yep. But for right now, it's pretty frustrating because Pittsburgh's facing – the third time now of what's going to be a one-and-done situation. We can already, I think, kind of paint them in for the one spot right there uh, and, and probably hosting the wild card game. And I always say this in terms of looking at their, uh, their, their situation there and uh, in terms of the great young players in baseball, almost an elder statesman by the – almost a gray beard by the standards the guys we're talking about here, Andrew McCutcheon, just because he's been up for a few years now. Yeah. One more thing to hate about Pittsburgh if you're a Clevelander, because you know who Andrew McCutcheon has turned out to be? That's who Grady Sizemore was supposed to be. Yeah. He was supposed to be that guy. And he was for a, for a blimp. Yeah, for, for a period of for time. For a blink, rather. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, you know, McCutcheon is that guy. And, and, and now they're building around him and filling it in, you know, with the likes of Marte in the lineup. Uh, Polanco really starting to kind of come on this year. And Neil Walker has been a kind of a perennial for them. Pedro Alvarez, I mean, he'll always have a hole in his swing, but, man, when he connects, look out. Yep. You know, up and down the lineup here, uh, go over to the Orient to get them some uh, pop from uh, Kang at shortstop here. That's he's, working out. He's turned out to be a real nice player. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. I mean, and that's a situation where I don't quite lump them in with, you know, the likes of the Indians or the Mets or whatever, but they have a little bit of depth here in a sense of, yes, in the playoffs, you are going to have to sacrifice – 
uh, Cole in the wild card game. But it doesn't necessarily make them dead for what comes after that, though. You look at uh, the kind of year that Burnett has had and some of the other guys that they can trot out there, and it does give you some sense that, uh, you know, they may be able to hang in a series yeah. that comes after that. Yeah, yeah they've, got a great, they've got a great team, and I look at them, too, and it's just – and I pull for them because they're in our area, mm-hmm. uh, and they handle their business the way I think you should handle your business uh, because they were a doormat forever. What was it, like 17 years or 18 years or something like that? They never made the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, since Bonds and – well, a, a, a run comparable to uh, uh, Kansas City in terms of futility. Well, Both of them go. have come on, yeah, and right. that is a very plausible World Series combination for this yep. year. Yeah. Oh, and that's yeah. the, the, the funny thing is I'm almost inclined to pick that as a World Series combination just because. Kansas like, City and, Pitt, and Pittsburgh? Well, yeah, because here's the weird thing, that they both had the heyday in the 70s, and it kind of ended in the 70s for Pittsburgh. Kansas City's went into yeah. the 80s a little bit, but they never played each other. Here's something that's really weird is because when I, I always try to look up statistical oddities before some of the big playoff series. And, and, and I found that uh, the Royals and the Angels, I think it was like every year between 76 and 86, one of the two of them was in the playoffs. Or I'm sorry, no. Uh, well, the, the Angels and, and the Royals, now they were both in the Western Division, so they could never play each other in the playoffs. Right. But they, they were both in, I think, one of them was in from 76 to 86. But Kansas City and Baltimore, remember, their primes yeah. were a long overlap. Ken, yeah. they never played each other in the 70s or the 80s. And never then they played did. each other no. last year in the American League Championship Series. Kansas City, Pittsburgh, that would be that ser- World Series deferred from, like, 1978 or so. I prefer that over a Subway Series. It could be. It, it could very well pan out that way. But, uh, you know, Pittsburgh's going to be uh, right there uh, in all likelihood hosting a game. And who it, that's going to come down to? The leading candidate at the moment, the Chicago Cubs. And, and I remember, and out of, out of kindness for our friend Dave Adams, FDH Lounge Dignitary, I won't, I won't give the name of this person. It's a friend of Dave's, a very pompous friend of Dave's, who argued with me last off season about why would Joe Madden go to the Cubs? Don't you understand what a dumpster fire they are? Like, they're ever going to be good. A guy who is just so, so pompous, who are like, okay, buddy, we'll see what happens. You know, and you look at what, again, you know, Madden going there, it's, he would probably say, now, this is a guy who never admits he's wrong. Well, you know. Madden went there, and Madden turned it all around. Well, it, maybe they also had the good minor league crop that I was talking about at the time that came up. you got to have something to turn around. Exactly. You know, you bring in the likes of a Lester, Arietta. we talked about much, much earlier with Baltimore taking that step forward. You know, poster children for the dominant players in baseball, finally getting a no-hitter. But that's the kind of thing I think that took to put him on the national radar because that's a guy that should have been there all along. Clearly yeah. one of the top 20 players in baseball at the moment. And I tell you, there is a, we haven't mentioned this. We've talked about all these young kids, but you guys, uh, Joe Girardi, you mentioned as a uh, possible manager of the year. Mm-hmm. Madden has got to be in the, in the mix in the top five or so. You've got Bruce Bochy. Certainly. You've got Francona. You're seeing a, an era of good, good managers yep. to go along with. I just thought about that now as you're talking because I have nothing but agreement with you on this stuff because Madden keeps these young kids like some managers couldn't. Yep. He keeps them loose. He's a character. Um, I mean, he did that with the Rays. Yep. You know, wearing tuxes and stuff like that and mm-hmm. goofy shit. Oh. I'll tell you this. Uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody that we have now both been uh, privileged to do some broadcasting with and somebody who I know is looking forward to doing some broadcasting uh, subsequently with Life's a Pitch, FDH Lounge Dignitary and 21st Century Media Alliance member Steve Callis. Yes. Uh, he's been steadfast for a couple of years, uh, just pounding his fist. Joe Madden is the best in baseball. And I agree. I mean, I think – now – We'll talk about this in a little bit. Maybe it's hard to pick against the Bruce Bochy when you look at what he's had to work with and he got three rings. But, I yeah. mean, it's sort of like what are you doing with what you got? And, you know, as far as he was able to take Tampa Bay in a situation where the organization was never as committed financially. And, again, as an Indians fan, I always kind of, you know, turn a stink eye to that excuse about not spending money. But in Tampa, it may actually be legitimate because they didn't support the team even when it was good. Right. Chicago, it's a different situation. He has more resources to work with there. Theo Epstein, the front office, he's going to get more of what he needs, and I think we're going to get a chance to see how good Joe Madden is. 
you know, but yeah, a good chance to make the playoffs here. They, they're uh, they're first in line right now. Uh, for well, the wait, si- well, wait a minute here. That means they uh, have for, for the second spot, I should say. Yeah. So what you're saying is they have really good management. They they do. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Say no more, Tribe yes. fans. Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. They have a strong front office, and again, you know this this aforementioned. Uh, observer of the Cubs who was arguing with me last offseason. Again, he was observing the bottoming out process in Chicago. You have that. Hello, the people in Houston, I think they didn't expect it to be completely done last year. I think we expected at least a year of, you know, 500-esque treading water, which is about where I had Houston this year, you know, making the move next year. Same thing kind of with the Cubs. The Cubs are certainly playing way above what most people thought, even the biggest optimists. But this is an era in baseball that, you know, the, the Cubs and the Astros sort of personify this era right now where being young is not something that's going to hold you back. If well, you're good, it doesn't matter if you're young. And the thing with that young stuff, they got a, they mm-hmm. got a great manager, they got a great front office, but the thing with young kids playing in any sport probably, yep. but I know it from baseball, and I always preach this when I'm coaching, you need to play in meaningful games. Yes. Right now – Colorado, they're playing. There's no meaningful games. Right. You know, some of these teams like that. It's just right. like they're so far out of it. It's like just get they it They are indeed, but yeah. The, but they're in the pressure cookers. Right. Day in and day out trying to get a, a playoff spot. And that's going to that's mm-hmm. gonna serve them well. And we've heard a lot of hype this year, and deservedly so. Chris Bryant, uh, a front runner for National League Rookie of the Year. But I'll tell you what, in terms of somebody who is – more of a finished product at the moment, if not necessarily quite as high of a ceiling, but an unbelievable talent. And again, not on the level of the Goldschmidt's, the Carlos Correa's, whatever, at this point, and maybe he never will be, but as far as somebody who's not too far back, Anthony Rizzo is just, that guy can can play for my team anytime, buddy. You know, I mean, they've got, they've got him sprinkled all over the the diamond. They do indeed. And the kid they just brought up, was it, uh, was the kid they just brought? Uh, Kyle Schwarber, because he's been doing a lot yes. for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has been uh, amazing, and yeah, this this starting pitching. It's been a career year, uh, certainly for uh, Jason Hamill. That has really helped my uh, fantasy team a lot. <laughs> Very grateful for that. But uh, yeah, the, the Cubs have been unbelievable. They are the uh, they're in the driver's seat right now for the number two wild card seed in terms of continuity let's stay there before we go to the division leader in the national league west and the likely division winner the team that's trying to run them down notwithstanding the fact that it is an e- it is not an even numbered year but nevertheless san francisco in the thick of it they're playing as though it's 2010 2012 2014 and a team that's won three titles in five years yep. it, it's certainly by the modern definition of the word uh, a, a dynasty and again you go back to teams like the turn of the century yankees aside from the fact that again you know they're the yankees guys like me and you can't get behind them whatever that's sort of a separate thing but if you're just going to compare it to guys who come together play as a team overachieve relative to what you think when you see the stat sheet i mean you do have some guys there i mean hunter pence is a stud when he's healthy oh. Buster Posey, if we're going to define Derek Jeter as the face of baseball or the face of winning baseball, he became known as the greatest winner of his generation. Buster Posey has grabbed that torch and sprinted with it. I mean, that's, you know, or Madison Baumgartner. I think of them in the same breath as sort of like the co-Jeters as far as the successor to that. We don't think of a pitcher as much in there, in that realm, but if we could, I mean, Bumgarner is one of the greatest big game guys in baseball history. What he did, games, and this is one of the things, too, about it just makes me want to pull my hair out about what the mainstream knows about baseball these days. How is Madison Bumgarner not on the cover of every cereal box oh from here gosh. to Nome, Alaska, after Game 7 of the World Series? His home runs. Yeah. He's a pinch hitter this yeah. year. And, you know. How's he not marketable? A big bear of a country boy? You can't yeah. do anything with that? Are it's you like kidding Paul me? Paul Bunyan. Yeah, yeah. He's sort of like the Goldschmidt of pitchers. <laughs> exactly. And here, and I'm, I'm a convert. Um, one of those shows in 12, 13, 14, or mm-hmm. whatever the case may be, I remember, I think it was Tim Faust was with us when we were doing a playoff okay. thing. And I said, there's no, or a prediction beginning of the year, I said, there's no way the Giants are going to win squat 
they have a bunch of, and I remember this saying this distinctly, a bunch of banjo hits. Yeah, slappies. A bunch of slappies. And not the case anymore. They win and they win, and I'm thinking they got the biggest headed manager in all yeah. of baseball. His head. I don't know how they, how they <laughs> fitted a hat. It him. is mammoth, yeah. But, uh, I mean, Bruce Bochy, my, what can you say about this guy? I mean, year in and year out. So, that being said, I'm not going to write him off yet because no. that is such a traditional rivalry between yeah. the Dodgers and the Giants. It is. Um, it is. And it's – well, the thing that's funny, too, is – you know, you go back to something like this. I had just there, – there's a number of great pop culture things that I've only experienced in recent years. I only in recent years, and, and, I, and, and, and my, my intro to it was seeing the 10-minute car chase scene on YouTube. I finally saw Bullet. Oh, I, did you? Oh, that's yeah. a great movie. I saw it at the theater. Oh, oh did you? <laughs> oh, God. All right. Well, there's a part in there when <laughs> – that is, that is awesome, by the way. That is, that is too great for words. Oh, when, what time is it? i got to go to bed. <laughs> time for me to go to bed. When they're in that crappy hotel room there not long before the break-in and the shooting – and, and, and they're reading off the scores of a Giants-Dodgers game. I'm just like, really? That's, that's right. Even in, like, 68, this was a big deal. And oh. if you go back, like, 1928, it was probably a oh, big deal because sure. it was all in New York at the time. The 40s and, like, and 50s. That's an ancient, yeah, it's just like there are just touchstones. that kind of, Yeah, like you said, we all kind of think of, like, the 40s and 50s of, like, you know, sure. the Brooklyn Dodgers and, you know, you know Mickey and Duke and, uh, uh, and, Willie. and Willie. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's – it's an enduring kind of a thing. Unfortunately, the new millennium being what it is, it sometimes takes the form of somebody wearing the wrong jersey to the wrong stadium, getting the crap beating out, beaten out of them outside the stadium. Yeah. You know, so the rivalry can go too far. But that's the bitterness and the historical kind of thing behind it here. You know, and again, the Dodgers, uh, the best team money can buy. They've taken yeah. that torch from the Yankees. Except, you know, the Yankees actually did something with it. The Dodgers... Again, up and down the line, I mean, they look like the perfect blend. I mean, we can quibble a little bit and say this rebuilt bullpen that they got at the deadline isn't going to be all that in a, in a bag of chips. But beyond that, if they do what they're supposed to do, who can stop them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Dodgers have got everything lined up. But uh, uh, we'll see. It's going to be fun. It is going to be. It's going to be amazing. As the year's gone along, I mean, Jock Peterson goes from starting in the All-Star game, which I kind of thought was questionable. He had a very good first half, but still to getting benched subsequently. So, Mm -hmm. you know, still some questions there. Which Yasiel Puig is going to show up? You never know. Right. But, uh, well, you know, my my picks, I'll go back to as we were saying here, you know, Mets, Cardinals, Dodgers to win the divisions. I'll say Pittsburgh and the Cubs in the wild card. I picked St. Louis before the season. I can't go against them now, so I'll say St. Louis over Toronto in the World Series. How, how do you see it St. shaking out? St. Louis over Toronto. That would be a fun one, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, I'm going to go with the Metropolitans in the East. I'm going to go with the Dodgers and St. Louis as um, okay. the division winners. So we agree all the way up to that point. We do, and, geez, lightning will probably strike us here, but uh, Pirates and the Cubs in the wild card game. Okay. Um, I think everybody's too far out to catch – Whoever is the second part of that, and the Pirates are four and a half at this point, as we speak, above the Cubs. Right. So, and then, boy, this is, gosh, I just said I was going to pick the Giants or not doubt them, but I, I have to go with the machine that I know is a St. Louis against uh, the Blue Jays. All right. And that's, uh, you, you like them to beat the Blue Jays? If so, we're in uh, concurrence all the way down the line. I don't think I've ever done a show where we've had complete no, unanimity of me with somebody else. This could be a first. Yeah, I gotta go with the, I gotta go with the Cardinals. I am so impressed with the way they put the way they handle their business, and with what a second or third year manager. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, Matheny's had them there every year, and it, it's not hard to, to or it's, it's not easy rather to follow a guy like Larusa. And you know, quite frankly, you look at the hash of it that Brad Ausmus has made in Detroit. Yeah. Now, part of that is bad contracts and a team that's aging and whatever. But, yeah. Yeah. you know, it, it, lest we think, oh, well, he was just handed the perfect situation. Uh, well, uh, they, Brad Ausmus was handed a pretty good situation after Jim Leland. And look at what's happened on his watch. Yeah, and I said so. that, I remember, when we did that on a show. And mm-hmm. uh, our friend Steve. Um, I thought last year they were going to take a dive. Yeah. But I was a year too early. Yeah, that's that. You know, you and I saw the same thing happening here. I'll tell you what, too. Yeah, you know, in St. Louis, you know, both on field, 
uh, in, in terms of the production that they've gotten out of uh, Hayward this year, who I mean, hasn't lit the world on fire but has right. done just enough, both on field and then off field, lest we forget this is a team out of any team in baseball that could be playing with a big cloud over it this year. I mean, and I don't, I don't mean this in a bad way, although it's going to sound like a bad way, but I haven't heard anybody mention Oscar Taveras once. And that's, no. you know. No, and how much could they have used it? Well, they could have. They really could have. Wow. And they had to trade I mean. Shelby Miller to get his replacement, who has had a very good year with Atlanta. So, I mean, it's not like they didn't have to pay a price for that in terms of talent. But then also, you know, in a it's a good thing for them on field that we aren't talking about Oscar Taveras, uh, but uh, you know I guess it's a good thing that's not affecting them and bringing them down because you know Oscar or nobody else would have really wanted that. But it's it's really interesting. I mean, you know, look at the '93 Indians with Steve Olin. You know what I mean? Yeah. That can destroy your psyche. Oh yeah, and, and he's he's because he's one of those kids, Rick, mm-hmm. or was or projected to be. Yeah, like a Bryant, like a Harper. I mean, he was in that. We're kind of ending this on a downer, but you're right. You're he was a no, yet another. Promising. He was a Harper esque, you know, Goldschmidt esque. Not the same kind of guy. Not a tall power hitter, but still, you know, but he power was a, speed, whatever. A, a, be, those guys are beyond blue chippers. Yes, in my mind, that those was are him. The elite. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that's those, those have the Hall of Fame possibilities. Well, um, and I'll tell you what, though, and that's like. And it's a shame that it's he's always going to be remembered for what he was supposed to be, and it's going to be like, man, in an alternate history, he hit ten home runs in the twenty twenty five World Series, you know. But he he for whatever it's worth, I mean, he did have that moment. He did have the home run last year in the playoffs against San Francisco, and he gave us something tangible. Yes, to show, you know, hey man, when I get everything figured out, this is what I'm going to be. And unfortunately, circumstances took another, you know, branch from there. But going down on a more positive note with yes, the Cardinals. Yes, please. <laughs> I'm depressing myself here. Watching the Cardinals, and I love watching how they pitch the batters, all these major leaguers, and how I would mm-hmm. call a pitch and stuff, and I'm so far behind these guys' light years. But mm-hmm. I enjoy watching them work. It. I've always said, ever since I've seen the Indians back in 95, mm-hmm. um, with Albert Bell, Tommy Ramirez, the whole gang, is that those outstanding team, that outstanding team in particular, when they had that group together, mm-hmm. they won games in the last at bat or the late innings. Right. To me, that is always marked since that time. Not great, not good teams, but great teams. That's right. Because they can win at the end. Moss the other night. Yeah. Moss didn't do diddly for us here in Cleveland. Right. But he puts on a birds on a bat uniform Mm -hmm. and boom he turns into the superpower and he does what he's always done before he came to cleveland and here we here and i watch him and it's just like okay we're playing whoever let's say let's say we're playing colorado or st louis Uh, st louis all of a sudden will say keep the seat warm you guys stay ahead the first six or seven innings and then hey thanks much get out of my seat we're taking this game right and it could be three to two. It'll be a wild throw. It'll be something goofy, but uh, they've got it. They've got it. Well, it, but here's the thing, though, and 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 let's bring it around on this note because the difference between winners and losers, and ironically, it, it involves the two teams I picked to be in the World Series this year. I picked Cardinals over Indians. Cardinals or Indians, or uh, Cardinals are winners. Indians are losers. Here's the difference. He goes to St. Louis and he produces. He's in a situation with the aforementioned Hayward, Matt Holliday, Matt Carpenter, etc. Yeah. In Cleveland, it's like, gee, I sure hope Carlos Santana doesn't go in the crapper this year, and he did. And it's a thing of it, it's whack a mole with, with with organizations that aren't committed. It's like, hey, great, this is Jason Kipnis sucked last year, and he's really good this year. Okay, well. Unfortunately, Carlos Santana was really good, especially down the stretch last year, and now he sucks this year. There are no sure things. And I understand all the positivity trolls in the Indians fandom community would be like, no team has sure things. You're being a knuckle dragger. No, but you can look at it scientifically like a team like the Cardinals do and be like, okay. There's a really good chance Matt Holliday is going to have an excellent year. And Jason Hayward yep. and Matt Carpenter. And that's that's the thing. It's who you're surrounded by. They, and I, the Indians lineup 
in retrospect, didn't have the bare minimum amount needed to yeah. carry them through. And this, I heard this today. They, they did an, somebody did an interview with Moss on his home run. Mm-hmm. And not to give credit to Moss, but he's just new with the team, fairly right. new with the team this year. And he had a statement in the interview. What's the difference? How did you? How are you fitting in mm-hmm. with the Cardinals? He said. And to me, this was telling not only to the Indians organization, but to other teams that aren't very successful. Mm -hmm. And it was all 25 guys, coaches and managers, are in the game pitch by pitch. Yep. In a complete game. All of us. Mm -hmm. Which to me, reading between the lines, said these other teams where I came from, let's just say the Indians. Yep. They've got guys that are doing a circle jerk or going back (laughs) and having a few beers. Yep. You know, packing their bags, ready to go home. Or worrying about Bro Ohio signs in right field. And to me, that statement alone was telling. It is. That every one of them are in it from the beginning to the very end. Yep. That's absolutely true. And uh, that's, again, you know, bringing it full circle here on picking St. Louis to win the World Series, which is the same pick I made at the beginning of the season. That's why winning organizations do that. And, uh Again, uh, I, I certainly think that uh, when you're talking about uh, winning, the melding together of the FDH Lounge and Life's a Pitch here in the 21st Century Media Alliance <laughs> is the epitome of that. So, Ken, yeah, it's guess. always a privilege and a pleasure to be able to talk baseball with you, my friend. You were coming on to our turf for this one. I look forward to coming on to your turf in the near future, returning gotta, the favor, and we're going to have some fun. i got to get it going. You so, will. You will, will, buddy, and it's going to be a great thing. In the meantime, this has been a great sneak preview of that. Uh, getting together to talk baseball with you here again. Thank you, Ken, for everything today. And thank you, everybody, for checking us out for FDH Lounge Mini Episode number 599. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, GoBoard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse, and The Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 